Good afternoon. How are you doing? Happy February 18th. So my name is Brian Purdy. I teach math here at Moorpark College, but not this semester because I'm on sabbatical. So I'm happy to see a lot of people here because I was afraid that without my own students to bribe, no one would show up. So yay, people are here. That's exciting. And so we're talking about uh, using mathematics to separate myth from reality because this is the year of myth and reality at Moorpark College. And so a purpose of our talk, or if you prefer your student learning outcomes of our talk, is to show that logic, mathematics, and statistics allow us to model the natural world. And in other words, we will use the tools of mathematics to uh, separate fact from fiction, myth from reality, whatever words you like to use. And so I was hoping I could get a better copy. That's the best I could get. But the older sister's complaining about how she hates word problems, and then the younger son who's really into math. Uh, it's talking about how it's with mathematics is how you really, it actually really gets exciting because you're able to find out all these things about the world. Of course, the guy that does Foxtrot is a physicist, so he's probably not necessarily into math as for math's sake itself. But hopefully what this comic is saying in a somewhat humorous way is what we'll be able to show today. So we're going to look at four main topics uh, as we go through it today. And so here's our mathematical prerequisites. JK, as you kids say. <laughs> that means just kidding. I had to look it up to make sure I did it right. And then there was like this list of like a hundred things that the kids of today use for text. I'm like, oh my God. Isn't it easier just to write the words and memorize all that? Uh, but all we need is really algebra and geometry, and just in the sense that you've taken it before, and so you've had that much math in your life. But we're, I'm not going to show you any math, um, maybe just a teeny bit of an equations. And for this sort of thing, I mean, just you think about like math for the liberal arts major sort of thing, or the concepts. We just want to talk about what are the concepts of mathematics, what can they, some of them do for us, so we can see that the importance of math overall, in particular for our, our topic and our theme for the year, which is separating myth from reality. And so before we get to that, though, looking at our, the four questions we're going to ask and answer, is we want to talk about a little bit what it means to be a mathematical theory and a mathematical model. And this isn't directly germane, it just cracked me up because it's totally true. Whenever you're a mathematician and you go out to eat, everyone looks at you and wants you to figure out the, the tip. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. You, right? So the more math you do, the less you remember the little stuff. All right, so let's talk about uh, mathematical theory. So math, kind of when we're going through school, we know there's okay, algebra and there's geometry, then there's like this calculus thing, and that kind of seems about it in the world. But there's tons and tons and tons of different branches of math. And some, a lot of them overlap, they intertwine, and that, we'll see that even today with some of the applications that we look at. And this is one of the things I, I want to drive home, is that the mathematical model themselves doesn't really care about the world, it doesn't know about the world, but it's still able to model more than one thing. And so the two main branches of math, though, are called pure and applied. So if you were to ask someone who majored in math, oh, were you pure or applied, they would know exactly what you meant. If you're a pure mathematician, you're focused more on math for its own sake, just proving things about math. And if, it, if it's relevant to the world, that's great, but that's not your focus. Applied math, just like it, it, it sounds like, you're concerned about applying math to the world and see what it can tell us. So those are the two big branches uh, that we have in math. And under them, there's a whole bunch of things. They're all theories, but only some of them have the word theory in them. So let's talk about a mathematical theory. So usually, it's a collection of axioms and definitions and it focuses on a particular type of mathematical structure and then what you could prove the propositions from them. So some examples in pure math, I won't read them all so you could read them, but so like set theory, group theory, combinatorics, which we'll see today, uh, as well as probability theory, and applied math, game theory, which we'll look at today, as well as mathematical psychology, and uh, measurement theory, in case you haven't seen that before. Measurement theory is where you actually look at the theory of how we measure things and how we could do that accurately, and then statistics. So that's what a mathematical theory is. This is different than how theory is used in science, right? So we have the theory of evolution. And so a theory of evolution in science, or what, uh, any sort of theory, the Big Bang Theory, right? It, so it purports to explain an aspect of the natural world. And the good theories, we keep them, and as we need to, we modify them and make them more accurate. 
And usually to be a good theory in science, you have to have a mathematical backbone to it, right? Um, in mathematics, though, a theory, again, nothing to do with the natural world. It just means a collection of basic statements like you had in geometry is the best way to think about when you had your geometry in high school. You have your basic statements, and from there you proved everything else. So that's the, the key idea of what a mathematical theory does for us. All right, mathematical model. See, that's funny. Because she, ha she has, yeah. Uh, that's as risque as we get, so don't worry. It's, it's so a mathematical model is a description or system that describes the structure of the natural world using mathematics and language. And so particularly we use mathematical uh, models in the natural and social sciences. And the social sciences is much more recently. Uh, math models for the physical world, at least in of doing a really good job at it, has been since the, the time of Newton, so over 500 years now. You really using mathematics in the social sciences like psychology and political science and sociology and anthropology. That's much more recent, actually more just 50, 75 years that that's actually been attempted. And then engineers, of course, they use uh, mathematics so they can do things like make lights and put on buildings. So I always joke with my students, but it's true. If, they're, if you're ever stuck on an island, a desert island to me, which I'm sure would be terrible for many reasons, but among the reasons it would be terrible, I'd be absolutely no use for getting us off the island. You didn't need an engineer for that. The best that I could do is give you a mathematical model when we would die <laughs> and resort to cannibalism. But uh, otherwise, not going to be much use. So we're going to look at four questions today, and we're going to answer them. And at the end, we should have some time. We'll take questions from you all. Uh, but these are the four questions that we're going to look at. And I just picked them because they're ones I'm familiar with, and also hoping that they'll serve as good exemplars of what mathematics can actually do for us, and how it does really allow us to distinguish myth from reality. And so these are the four questions. Can an Alzheimer's patient learn your name? And that comes from the field of mathematical psychology. And the next one is, can I win the lottery? Of course, it's our probability theory. Can all Cretans be liars? And we'll talk about who Cretans are. Maybe you all know. And the last one, can you survive the zombie apocalypse? So we'll answer these four questions, and we're going to answer it mathematically. And then that's the way we know we're right. Uh -huh. Take that, philosophers. I was actually a philosophy major, and I took graduate classes in philosophy, but it got frustrating because they never answered anything. And now someone had done a lot of math, I just couldn't take anymore, so I had to stop. Hey, that's my brain, by the way. I know some of you have always wondered. But yeah, I do. I do have one. <laughs> I was a subject for one of my friends in grad school for a fMRI uh, study, so there's pictures of my brain. All right. So why do Alzheimer patients have trouble learning new names or new words, whatever the case may be. But just to phrase it as a, a question, I thought learn it as a name. And I know some of you, uh, at least some of the math people, have seen parts of this before when I've talked about uh, learning disabilities in mathematics. Um, but we can think of the cognitive process of learning a new word or pair words as having two parts. You need to, when you get the information, right, you need to store it in your brain, right? And then at some later point, whether it's five minutes later, an hour later, two hours later, right, whatever it is, a day later, you need to retrieve that information, right? So you get some information, it gets inputted, and then at a certain point you need to be able to recall it and retrieve it. And so the question is with people that suffer from Alzheimer's, is it the issue that they never are able to store it in the first place, in which case that tells us something very important. So when you want to help you with Alzheimer's and you know what you need to focus on, or when you're coming up with drugs or um, other types of therapy, or is it that they're able to store the information, but then their brain has trouble retrieving it? And again, with uh, what we're able to know about the brain now with the mapping, we're able to focus on the part of the brain that has a retrieval as opposed to the storage. And so we can think of this in a, in a, as a binary cognitive process. By binary, of course, meaning two. Either you store it or not, you retrieve it or you don't. 
But if we ha want a good model, we need to have taken account the possibility that people make mistakes, right? You might not get the information right in the first place, right? You might not get the word right or the name right. Or I mean, this happens all the time when we're talking, particularly when we're a rush or we're trying to do something else. Or if you're like me, you have four kids and you say a name and you hope it's the right one. And I'm Brendan, my brother's Ryan, his son is Connor, my sons are Liam and Sean. So if there are, well, all of us are around at a certain point, my mom just starts going, Irish boy's name. And hopefully the right one turns around. And so yeah, sometimes we just, we know the information, it's stored there correctly, we just mess up retrieving it. And it has nothing to do, there's something wrong with our brain, it's just we make mistakes. And so what we can use to investigate this issue is called a binary multinomial processing tree model. There you go. Uh, processing, because we're looking at cognitive processes. The multinomial, so if you've had statistics, you learned the binomial distribution. Well, this is the extension of the binomial distribution for when you have more than just those two options. Uh, binary goes back to the fact that we have this binary cognitive process. And a tree, because we're going to see it looks like a tree, at least the math version of a tree, which is in uh, graph theory. And then model, be, uh, going back to what we talked about a little bit ago, mathematical model. So th that's why we have those five words there. Though in the literature we get lazy and we usually just say BMPT model. And so this is why it's called a tree. And mathematicians, because we're awesome, our trees grow down. The root's always at the top. And, the, and these are the leaves. And so these are our leaves. These represent the categories. And again, I'm going to wave my hands purposely on the math and the details of wha why this all works. And hopefully, and to an extent, you'll trust me. But if you do have any questions about any of this or you want to see, and I didn't even actually bother to do the, the references. If you want references for any of this, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. Just talk to me afterwards. And so what this tree is trying to tell us is that either we store it correctly or we don't, right? There's the binary process. So there's going to be some probability you store it correctly, some probability that you don't, some probability that you retrieve it correctly given that you stored it correctly, and you retrieve it incorrectly given that you stored it correctly. And then these U's, the U's are um, taken into account. Let's go one more. So this is what the model looks like. And actually, I did give the reference here. So you have these parameters, and that's what makes it stat. So these are just numbers, probabilities between 0 and 1, of course, of the probability of this occurring. And so you do this based on real data, right? You give these tests to people with Alzheimer's, and you see what comes back, and then you run it through this statistical process. And so, and it says there at the bottom, let me do one more. And so this particular model is called a pair clustering model because there's actually two models. There's one for when you have words in pairs and one as singletons. But I just wanted to show you this one so you get the idea. So associated with every group of categories, so for example, category four is neither word pair is recalled. So if you're given Alzheimer's patient a pair of words, for example, beer whiskey, right? That's a good combination. And if they recall neither of them correctly, the, that's the category four, and the probability of that occurring is based is this. So it's based on, again, the parameters, but the parameters comes from the data. So that's the idea. So we're getting a, because the trick, of course, is when we're looking at the brain, we can't get in there. We don't know, are they storing or retrieving it? And so what we have for all these, uh, right toward the end, I have the mathematics involved. And again, we're not doing any math, and that's actually part of the most mathy one that we show you. So we use statistical analysis, something called the maximum likelihood estimate, uh, sorry, estimate, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It gives you the estimate that is most likely. And if we, we do that, and you can also use some other statistical methods as well, in addition to the other part that's built into this, because you have this tree structure and you're multiplying down the, the branches, you're also using some uh, graph theory and formal language theory as, long as, as well as combinatorics. So there's actually a whole bunch of fields of mathematics that are used to solve this one problem. A lot of them are kind of sitting in the background. But that's all the math that we're using here. So then to get to our answer, 
Uh, what the data has shown through using this process, and it has since been uh, replicated using other methods as well, um, but that original uh, paper in 99 was the first one that gave an answer, and then as happens in the literature, people went back and forth, you're right, you're wrong, you're right, you're wrong, and eventually people say that the answer is yes, in the sense that they can store your name, or the pair of words, whatever it is, but they have the difficulty retrieving. And as it turns out, people with organic brain damage due to alcohol abuse, um, as well as uh, some of the mathematical disabilities, also have the same problem retrieval. So again, it's not, it's not the storage, but it's the retrieval. So that, again, yeah, I don't know. So the myth and reality, or rather the truth of it all, is why do Alzheimer patients having trouble learning your name or new words? It's not so much that they can't store it, it's that they have that difficulty retrieving it. And then that knowledge then allows doctors and scientists to, to work on cures, right? Or therapies that will focus on the retrieval aspect, not the storage aspect. So in the end, it actually ends up being a very practical result. So that's our first question and answer. All right, my next one, one of my favorites. So there's something called the Powerball, and you pay two dollars. Did you know that, you guys? All right. All right. I see who gambles here, Cindy. All right. And to win the grand prize, you need to match five numbers and also to have the Powerball. And I put it in quotes because technically they have it as one word, but that kind of bothers me, so I separate it out. So this is what it looks like. I, I, I had no idea. So you pick your, your numbers, and then you pick your Powerball, and then you could do this multiplier thing. If you pay an extra dollar, you could double how much you win unless you win the jackpot. Seems all very sophisticated to me. Uh, but the number of ways you could choose these five numbers is over five million. Number of different possibilities, the combinatorics. And if you've taken Math 15 here, or you need to take Math 15, when you learn combinatorics, you'll learn that, and it, I mean, it's very basic. Uh, the number of ways you can choose the Powerball itself, because there's only 35 options for that guy, is 35. So the total number of Powerball combinations is a lot. Because <laughs> it's a product of this 35 and the, about the 5 million, so there's over 175 million different possible combinations. So if you could buy that number of tickets, each with distinct numbers, you'd be golden. <laughs> right? Yeah, good. All right, now this is actually from the, ca uh, the Calif as the previous one. This is also from the state of California, California's lottery site. Uh, and I'll probably give my political commentary on that at the end. Uh, so these are the odds. And so there's that same number we just saw, right? So one divided that by that really big number, this is your probability winning the grand prize with your one $2 ticket. Point zero, 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 six, for all intents and purposes, right? And you can convert all these odds into probabilities in the same way, one divided by the five million, one divided by the 55, and so on. So the probability of winning anything with one ticket, one $2 ticket, whether it's the $4 or the grand prize, you're probably winning something is 3%. That's it. The problem of lose something is, well then, almost 97%. Now the, the thing that, it, I'm gonna get into my, my commentary. The thing that I like is so on the ca uh, California Lotto website, they don't have that extra column that says the probability. They only list the odds. Why do they do that? They want your money. You see this number, you might go, well, maybe not. But you go, oh, uh, what? yeah, whatever. Yeah, one in something chance, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so they actually don't have that column on that website, at least not for this table that I found. All right, so let's, Let's just suppose, right now I think it's $50 million, uh, but let's suppose 
which is a nice number, $100 million um, jackpot. And of course, we're ignoring the, issue, um, ignoring the issues with taxes and whether you get the money in the one lump sum or you get it as an annuity. I mean, you know, those, those other things. But the end result's going to be the same. So the expected value, which you learn how to calculate again in Math 15, for each $2 ticket you buy, you expect to lose $1.07 or win 93. So, I mean, you're expecting to lose money is the moral of the story, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have the lottery, right? <laughs> so that's our expected value. I don't know if they still teach this book in school. You guys read Shirley Jackson, The Lottery? Anyway, really good short story. You should read it. It's also like a 15, 20 minute uh, black and white movie they made based off of it. It's also really good. Uh, so what's the mathematics we use? Well, combinatorics allows us the number of ways to determine the winning combinations. And then probability allows us to compute the probabilities and the expected value. So the previous thing we looked at, our example with the Alzheimer's, I mean, that was some, uh, some math. You have to get, do like at least grad level math, you have to get to there. This is just, more for college, stats, no calculus, math, right? Just very basic, in a good way. So let's have some more thoughts on the lotto. If you drive one mile to a store and one mile back, based on the um, government statistics, the probability of getting killed or killing someone in an auto accident is six times more likely than winning the lotto. If you play, we know what Russian roulette is, right? So I said, my, so I was to my wife about this, and then she didn't know what it meant, but then my children were there, so I didn't really want to explain it. But right, in case you don't know, you get a revolver, you empty out the cylinder, you put in one live round, you spin it, right? But if you imagine that you have a gigantic cylinder, right? What is a 175 million or whatever it was? And if you played it 100 times a day for 48 years straight, your chance of never shooting yourself in the head would be 99%. So no, right? You're not going to win the lottery. <laughs> so I got a little more contemporary than the, that short story. The uh, Hunger Games, which is good. So and if you buy more tickets, your expected value is still going to be negative. Uh, and one of the ways that we could see this if you just look at the jackpot, you'd have to buy 10 million tickets just for a 5.7% chance of winning the jackpot. And with the, when the jackpot gets bigger and bigger and bigger, why does that happen? Because people are buying more and more tickets and no one's winning. And now you see why it's so hard for people to win. I mean, why does that jackpot get up to the 400, 500 um, million dollars? It's because it's so hard to get the right numbers because it's such a small chance. But what happens is when the jackpots get that big, tons and tons and tons of people are buying the tickets, which means that what often happens is then you have to share it, both with the government who gets the taxes, as well as the other people that, that win. So I uh, always have to do things in my life based on how many kids I had. I think I had two. I was teaching a night class at Mopar College, it was my first or second year then, and we were out of milk. So I stopped by the convenience store to buy milk on the way home. And apparently it was by lotto ticket night. You know, I just wanted to get home and I'm waiting in the line between all these people buying lotto tickets. And then, you know, they're buying 10, they're buying 20, they're buying 30, they're buying five. And I wanted to say, I didn't because I didn't want to get beat up, but I wanted to say, just buy one. If you're going to do it, buy one ticket. Otherwise, you're just throwing more good money after bad. So we can't win the lottery. Oh, well. But do, who does win the lottery? Well, the government, who gets the money from it, right? The companies that get paid to advertise the lotto and the TV stations um, that sell that advertising. The companies that actually run the lotto for the different um, states, they win from the lotto. All right, so let's talk about Cretans. So that's uh, Epimenides, the Cretan. And he's famous for saying, all Cretans are liars. And this is a logical paradox. So we'll, we'll have a little bit of fun with the, the logical paradox, and then we'll get to actually answering the question. And so if Epimenides, who is a Cretan, 
says all creeds are liars. Is this statement true? Well, if it's true, it's a lie, so it's not true. Or if it's not true, then it's not a lie, then it is true. <laughs> right? So this is called a logical paradox or an antinomy because you have these contradicting results and they both seem reasonable separately, but you put them together and then you're like, huh? And so one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Frank Plumpton Ramsey, he called this a semantic paradox as opposed to a syntactical one because it's based on the meaning of the words as opposed to the structure of the sentence itself. So that's the, the famous liar's paradox. So this is very old. So old, in fact, that in St. Paul's letter to Titus, he quotes our friend. One of themselves, a prophet, he doesn't mention my name, but that's who he's referring to, of their own said, Koreans are always liars, evil beasts, and slothful bellies. So that was kind of a, a way to introduce our next topic, was to talk about logical paradoxes a little bit. Um, but in mathematics and mathematical logic, or in the meta theory of um, logic, depending on what you want to call it, mathematicians actually have studied, because sometimes in mathematical structures, that same sort of contradiction happens. And so mathematicians have spent a lot of time, particularly the last hundred years or so, trying to deal with them. And as it turns out, some of them are always going to seem paradoxical to us. The most famous one, a uh, girl's incompleteness result, she was able to prove a theorem that said, I cannot be proved. It's a theorem, though. It's true. But let's suppose we do have a society where everybody lies, right? Can such a society actually exist? Now, also, we, we imagine that Epimenides was probably being hyperbolic. But let's suppose that we do have a society. There's the island in Crete, right? Picture taken by NASA. So can we actually have a society where everybody lies? Well, to answer this question, we're going to use evolutionary game theory. The name comes from the fact that it was originally game theory, and then they brought in the ideas from evolution and natural selection, kind of put them together, and we got evolutionary game theory. So let's assume that everybody that lives there is a liar, but there are mutants that invade the population. And our mutants, I call them honest. There's not, not a good antonym for liar, right? It's like truth teller or straight shooter. So I'm just going to make up the word honest. Seems to make sense to me. So you have this invasion by these people that tell the truth, the honest, into this island of all these liars. And so the question is, because societies evolve, the norms of societies evolve, right? Will the liars still predominate the society? Or will the honest end up taking over the society? Or will there be some mixture therein? And so this is what happens. So let's just suppose we run a simulation. That's the big thing in evolutionary game theory, is you run these simulations. Because what you need to happen in evolution, you need to see generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. But we can't go back in time and even if we found such a scenario, we can't go back in time and figure out how to do this. So we run computer simulations based on the mathematics, which we'll mention in a moment. So we run these computer simulations, so we're able to get through 100 generations of people. So that's one of the, the powerful things that computers has done for us, has allowed us to do these sort of mathematical simulations. And so let's suppose we have our 90% resident liars and our 10% invaders, the mutants who tell the truth. And so let's suppose, you can play around with different strategies, but in the end it's going to be the same way. When a liar meets a liar, he lies. When an honest meets a liar, he's going to tell the truth. And even if you've, and these are called the strategies, right? So a very famous strategy of this basic sen sense is called tit for tat. And it actually and it ends up being a very powerful strategy. And what tit for tat is exactly what it sounds like. If someone lies to you, you're going to lie back. If someone tells you the truth, you're going to tell them the truth back. And actually, that would be the most efficient strategy in this case. So as time progresses, especially if you think about in terms of this tit for tat strategy, the, li the people that used to be liars, or their ancestors that were liars, they'll start evolving into truth tellers. 
because they'll come to realize that it's much easier to have a workable society if you're telling the truth. So after 100 generations, you almost have, so the density of the population, right, from 0 to 1, 0 to 100 percent, toward the end you're going to have pretty much your invaders are going to be taken over, that is your truth teller, your honest ones, and then the ones that lie all the time have pretty much died out. And so the system of differential equations, and we have a differential equation uh, class here, and you probably could do this after you learned that, is uh, called the replicator-mutator dynamics. Replicator, because replication, right? You re replicate your genes. In this case, you pass on to your children, whether to be a liar or honest. And then the parts of the equation have these things, and I'll just let that be, but they take into account the normal evolutionary concerns we have. So can all Cretans be liars? Well, no, since any population of all liars will evolve over time into a population of honest. And of course, there'll still be those that lie, they're called politicians, and we all, you know, have our, our white lies, or whatever we call them, that, you know, we fudge about things, we make ourselves sound better than we actually are or whatever. But I mean, overall, people are generally going not to be sociopaths, and they're generally going to be honest. Uh, because it just works better that way. Like, I was driving my son, and he always asks me questions, my oldest one, and he asked, well, what happens if you park in front of someone's driveway? I'm like, well, you know, they you could get that person towed. But I said, no one really does that. He goes, why not? I'm like, well, because it's one of those things. If everyone started parking in front of everyone's driveways, it just, it we, we couldn't function. So it's the same idea. If everyone's lying, it's just not going to work. All right, so can we survive the zombie apocalypse? And the follow-up question, which you could answer on your own, is whether or not we'd want to. Um, and this is actually very similar to uh, can all Cretans be liars? And you could actually run the same type of analysis we did, um, which actually this one does. But in that we could talk about this in more of the game theoretic way. But we'll do it in more of a this straightforward way that I got from this paper. And so one of the reasons I want to do this, even though our Cretan case and our zombie case, are the mathematics is very similar, but they're two different, seem like very different applications. And again, that's one of the great powerful tools about mathematics is why do scientists use mathematics? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one of them is because it's just so powerful that, for example, Newton's law of cooling, it models the temperature loss that, that occurs, but it all, for certain drugs, it also models how fast the active characteristics in a pharmaceutical dissipate in your body. The exact same mathematical formula would do those completely two different things. And that's the power of mathematics. That's what I did want to emphasize with our creeds and our zombies, plus zombies are fun, was to really show you that we're going to be using differential equations again in a very similar models, and in this case as well, even though they're very similar, they're about very different topics, at least seemingly. All right, so let's imagine we have a zombie virus, which I hope we don't. And it's a contagion like, say, measles or Ebola, which have both been in the media recently. And we can consider the zombie virus to be pretty contagious based on how it's usually portrayed. Now, there's something called R0, R sub zero, but R0. And this stands for the reproduction number. And this tells us how contagious an infection disease is. And so we can think of R0 as the number of people who catch the disease from one person and on average spread it to how many other people. So, for example, hep C has an R0 of 2. Measles, which I know at Moore Park we had a measles scare. 18, that's a really high R0. And that's because the measles will just hang out in that same area for like a week or two, right? And just hang out in the air. So that's why I could get up to 18 people. So uh, Ebola's two, which is why, I mean, it, it was fun freaking about a, a, an Ebola, and there was definitely some, I think, fair to have some concerns about our government about it. I, one of the reasons why the, some of the CDC people, and I don't think they did the best to explain this, why they weren't totally freaking out was because it has an R small, R not. And then SARS is at four, mumps is at 10. And I, I don't actually know, and I mean, it kind of depends on what zombie universe you want to do, but Somewhere in here, you'd have to have an R naught for zombies. And so I don't know, you could ponder. I don't have an answer to that. 
But that does, will, does depend on uh, your model. If you're modeling any sort of infectious disease, real one or a fake one, like a zombie virus. But talking about the zombie virus is more exciting than talking about measles, right? Let's be honest. All right, so there's this wonderful paper. These grad students from Canada, I imagine they got drunk one night and they wrote this paper and they got published and every other mathematician is mad because he could have done it too. But they were just the ones that were smart enough to do it. They wrote a wonderfully entitled paper called When Zombies Attack. And the authors run through a bunch of scenarios to model the outbreak of zombie infections with different assumptions. And so the first model is the basic outbreak scenario. Everyone is susceptible. And what we see, the people that are susceptible go way down here. Well, why do they go way down here? Well, because the zombies are taking over. And it happens pretty quickly. The next two scenarios they looked at is imagine there's a 24-hour latency period. So you get the zombie virus, but it takes 24 hours before you're able to infect other people. And so if we look back at this graph, when they met, it was around three. So if you bring in the latency, it's at five. So it's managed to push back the time when the populations of zombies and humans flip, but things still aren't going to end well. And then you can imagine if you have a quarantine, and the quarantine further pushes the amount of time for the zombies to outnumber the humans and then take over, but the end result is still the same. And then the next scenario they looked at was if you had a cure. Now, the interesting thing that they did, which I thought was, was good, is that the cure didn't allow for immunity. You could get cured and then still become a zombie again. And again, even with that, and they had no quarantine in this case, our zombies are still going to take over. And so the last case it, they looked at is basically if the military was able to coordinate very quickly a very extreme, without prejudice, not worrying if you kill a bunch of people who don't have the virus. And that's, so you have a kill ratio of 25% each time you have an attack. And in that case, you could actually, within 10 days, eradicate the zombies, but there would be a lot of healthy people that would be taken out in the process. So, but that ruins all of our fun apocalyptic literature. So again, uh, this is nonlinear dynamics. So in popular culture, this is referred to as chaos theory. And again, like we, we did before, we use differential equations, the aforementioned predator-prey model, and again, just modified as it needs to be for contagions. So not likely, but again, the point is just like the show The Walking Dead is not really about zombies, right? Likewise, the point of this example is not really about zombies either. It's to show how flexible and powerful mathematics is that the same type of differential equations can model seemingly two very different phenomena. And so the mathematical model doesn't know what it's modeling, right? I mean, it's not a real thing. I mean, mathematicians would probably think of them as if they're real things, but they're not. They're just models, they're just math, they're just equations. They don't know whether we're modeling them for Newton's law of cooling or for a drug in our, our system. The math doesn't care. We care, but the math doesn't care. And so that's, again, the powerfulness is because mathematics is so flexible and able to deal with different situations. All right, so conclusion, and this is one of uh, MC Escher's uh, pictures. Uh, so mathematics along with our logic statistics and probability are the sciences of finding oh, typo on the last page oh, almost made it patterns I made it like 35 slides without a, pa a typo oh well are the sciences of finding patterns in the world and in mathematics st structures so the, for whatever reason there does seem to be some sense in the world whether it's real or not, that's another question, but there does just seem to be patterns in the world, and mathematics happens to be the best way to determine what these patterns are and then draw conclusions from them like we have just done. And so these are very powerful tools that allow us to discern the facts of the world and to separate truth from falsehood and myth from reality. 
So that's the end of my prepared remarks. Question. <laughs> you know, there's no applause sign. I was like waiting. <laughs> Questions. David Weinstein. You, you did have the comment up there. Can you win the lottery? Mm -hmm. The response was no. I would question that because people do. Well, in the same and way you could survive a zombie apocalypse. Right. So you can't, as an Alzheimer patient could remember your name. Yeah. So, so the word, I, I guess my quarrel is not a math one, but an English one as with, with the word is. can. <laughs> um, yes, I'm speaking in, in generalities. General. You would have been very good in a philosophy class. And I was. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, I, I, could, I could have something to say, but any other questions? All right, then uh, based on my last comment there, just something to think about in our couple of minutes we have, is, so I mentioned that mathematics, for some reason, is able to find structure, find patterns in the world. Well, the question, and this is a philosophical question, philosophers have been debating it since Plato and Aristotle, and probably most famously originally in Plato's uh, Euthyphro, is we have two options. One thing we can consider is that mathematics, the reason it's true, is it's kind of this separate entity floating up in the ether, and it's not observable, it's not empirical, right? And that's kind of, most mathematicians probably just naturally think that way, even if they don't dwell upon it. But then the question is, how can this thing that's not empirical be so good at explaining empirical phenomena? And then the other side of that is, well, you could say, well, let's make mathematics part of the world. Mathematics is empirical just like every other science. But then the problem if you make mathematics empirical just like every other science, how can you guarantee its absolute truth that we need and desire for mathematics? So in the back of all this, there are some, besides some use of grammar, there are some deep philosophical questions about what does it mean, and how is it that math is able to model the world so well? I'm going to drink some water. 